So you want to play an A-sharp, and you come from the world of keyboard synths and MIDI, so it's easy. Press the A-sharp key, or you send the appropriate MIDI command, the circuitry does your bidding, and an appropriately sharp A is played. But how does that work in modular synthesis, where you start with a VCO and a dream? It's called a voltage-controlled oscillator, but how does voltage turn this little brick of circuitry into the sound you wanted to hear? Let's look into that today. Hi everyone, I'm Jeff. Welcome back to Sound and Voltage. On this channel, I cover topics around modular synths, synthesizer technology, and unusual musical and sound design techniques. I don't monetize this channel, I don't take sponsors, so if you end up liking this video, consider hitting the like button and subscribing. It really helps the channel. If there's one concept that's absolutely foundational to the whole idea of a synthesizer, it would have to be the oscillator. It's even kind of hard to describe what a synth is without defining it in terms of one or more oscillators. Pretty much anyone getting into synthesis is pretty much already familiar with what an oscillator is, and if they aren't, it doesn't take them long to learn that it's the little bit of analog or digital magic that makes the waves wiggle up and down. The problem, though, is that because of that ubiquity, it's often just assumed that it doesn't need much explanation, but looking at the volume of questions on Reddit and Facebook, it seems like this isn't the case. And then when I started preparing for a video on frequency modulation, I kept finding myself assuming the viewer had some information that wasn't necessarily a given. So I'm sneaking this video in first. For a lot of people, this might start out a little obvious, but I think there's going to be something new for everyone, including a sneak peek reveal of what Exponential FM really is. It came as a surprise to me, so stick around for that. So in this video, I'm going to start by talking about the basic characteristics of a standard oscillator waveform. And then I want to look at the basic idea of volt per octave control over pitch, and how the thing we use to control that pitch is different from what the oscillator might be thinking. Then I'm going to dig a bit deeper into the ways to manipulate CV, including quantizers and sequencers, and how maybe we should be thinking about it as representing an interval and not a specific pitch. Then I'm going to look at how CV relates to the underlying frequency of a pitch, and then talk just enough about the exponential nature of pitch frequency as a setup for the coming video on FM. And then to cap everything off, I'm going to show the surprising way that Exponential FM ends up working. That's a fair bit to cover, and I think we have to start at the beginning. When we talk about an oscillator, we talk about a circuit that generates a repeating periodic signal. And that signal basically has four characteristics. The first is just the shape of the waveform that it outputs. There are a lot of options for strange waveforms out there to explore, but I'm just going to talk about the most basic and common shapes. And even if you're new to synthesis, there's a good chance you already know them. Sine wave, triangle, sawtooth, square. The main difference between them is that they generate sounds that are different, different timbres with differing harmonic content. I have a whole video about this if you want to dig into it. The second characteristic is amplitude. That's just a matter of how strong the signal is. This is closely related to how loud the output sound is going to be, but a big part of that loudness is also depending on the shape of the waveform. The more harmonics a sound has, the more energy it has, and the louder it'll seem. Generally, a VCO doesn't worry too much about the amplitude of the output. It just outputs the signal at a given voltage range, and then you deal with it by putting it into a VCA. A third characteristic is phase. This is really about where that periodic signal begins in relationship to a fixed point or another wave at the same pitch. There are some VCOs that allow you to play with this, but it isn't nearly as common, and I'm not going to be saying much more about it than that it exists. Maybe that can turn into another video later. The fourth characteristic, and this is the topic for the rest of the video, is frequency. Frequency is a measure of how many times per second the waveform completes. If it happens somewhere between 20 and 20,000 times a second, then you have sound, an audio signal of a fixed pitch depending on that frequency. If it's slower than that range, then you have an LFO, a low frequency oscillator, which is used for modulation. If you're coming in from a keyboard or a MIDI world, then pitch isn't something you really worry about. You want an A-sharp, so you hit that key or send that MIDI command, but what do we do in modular? I mean, I have a VCO here, and when I turn on the rack, it just starts out putting a tone. And I can use the pitch control to dial in that A-sharp I've been craving, but what now? I'm sure there are some people out there who can make a good show of playing a sequence by precise knob turning, but that clearly isn't the way to go. And this is, after all, a voltage-controlled oscillator, so let's get some voltage involved. The idea of volt per octave is pretty central to modular, and it's easy enough to understand the basics just from the name. Add one volt to the signal, and the pitch goes up by an octave. Often in modular, we'll turn to a sequencer to output this voltage, but for our purposes right now, I think this is going to work better. This is the Sputnik Modular Multi-Touch Keyboard Controller, and it outputs voltage levels depending on the key you press. Start up here at middle C, or at least the C that's in the middle of this keyboard, 
And when you look at the voltage monitor, you can see that it's registering 2 volts, or close enough. If I go up an octave, you'll see that the monitor registers 3 volts. If I go down an octave, it registers 1 volt. So that 1 volt per octave thing is checking out. So let's plug that into an oscillator and check the tuning. Oh, it's still on that A sharp. Actually, a different A sharp. This one's two octaves higher. So what's going on here? I'm pressing the C key, but I'm hearing an A sharp. If I go to D, it's playing a C. If I play an E, it gives me a D. This is something that confuses a lot of people, I think, getting started in modular, especially if they have come out of the MIDI world. In MIDI, each key has its own specific note number, and that note number represents a specific pitch. Middle C is MIDI note number 60, and number 60 represents that pitch specifically. Fire up a MIDI synth, hit middle C, and that's the note that'll sound. Give it the same input, it's going to play the same note. But modular doesn't work like that. The thing that's outputting the pitch information is separate from the oscillator that's actually making the sound. You can look at a keyboard and say, I'm playing a C, but really you're not. We just saw that the keyboard was just outputting two volts, and the oscillator that started out tuned to A sharp just jumped up two octaves from those two volts. In a case like this, you're going to need to bring those two into alignment by setting up what the oscillator does when there's no input or zero volts. And that's easy enough. Just remove the external voltage and use the pitch control knobs to dial in your C. I'm pretty lucky to have the Mordax here, but you don't need anything fancy to tune in the oscillator. Pretty much any guitar tuner app on your phone will do it, or you can pick up a physical one from Amazon for like $10, $20. And you know, that's really only if you care. <laughs> Lots of people don't. Feel free to tune it by ear to something you like. I'm not the music police. But if you do dial it to a C, then the keyboard here is going to behave as you expect. Play a C and get a C. Anyway, I found it really useful to change how I've sort of internalized the meaning of pitch CV. It's not really accurate, I think, to think of a specific voltage as representing a specific pitch. Instead, it represents an interval, a difference in pitch, not the specific pitch itself. That difference is relative to whatever the starting point you've defined on your oscillator is. And if it takes one volt to go up an octave, and there are 12 equally spaced semitones between them, then each and every semitone, from the very lowest to the very highest, is going to be 1 12th, or 0 0.08333 volts away from the neighboring ones. That's a little bit of a weird number to deal with, 83.33 millivolts per semitone, and it feels like maybe there'll be some rounding errors in there we have to deal with. But really, those differences are way below our ability to perceive a difference in pitch, so it ends up not really being a problem. Interestingly, there's an alternative to the 1 volt per octave standard, and that's what Buchla uses, which is 1.2 volts per octave, which made me scratch my head a little bit until I realized that with 12 semitones, each one is going to be exactly 100 millivolts, which means each cent of tuning is going to be exactly 1 millivolt. That kind of precision is satisfying, but not really necessary. And it's right about here where quantizers come in, in its most basic form. A quantizer just takes the input CV and makes sure that it maps to the chromatic scale. So all it has to do is take the input value and sort of snap it to a grid where every step is 83 millivolts apart. Quantizers can do a lot more than that, of course, and they probably deserve a video of their own. But as a basic idea, that's all it is. But once you've internalized the idea of voltage as representing an interval and not just a specific pitch, then some fun opportunities open up with sequencers. For instance here, I have an 8-step sequencer that was set up with some specific dialed-in notes for a melody line, and then I've got a 5-step sequencer here where I'm specifically looking for a series of intervals to transpose by. Then on each pass through the 8-step melody sequencer, I advance the 5-step transposition sequence, and then use a precision adder to add those voltages together. You can see the individual values and the sum here on the Mordax voltage monitor. But by doing this, I've taken an 8-step sequencer and a 5-step sequencer and created a 40-step sequence out of it by transposing one with the other. That's pretty cool. I know I was referring to some specific voltage values earlier, like 0.33 volts or 0.58 volts, but that was just to highlight that it's numbers that are going to be added together. You don't need to work those out by hand or anything. 
If you want to transpose up by a fifth, just plug the transposition sequencer into a VCO, make sure the VCO is tuned to C, and then turn the sequencer step knob up until it reads G. And if it turns C into a G, then it'll also turn A into an E and an E into a B. With the whole volt per octave control voltage thing managed, we're ready to talk about the actual frequency of a given pitch. The very name, volt per octave, describes a linear increase in voltage as the pitch goes up. And you know, if you've never really looked at the relationship between frequency, the actual number of times that an oscillator wiggles back and forth per second, and the pitch, the way our human ears interpret it, it might be a surprise to find out that if you go up by an octave, the frequency actually doubles. If the oscillator does its wiggle 440 times a second, that's a frequency of 440 hertz, that corresponds to a pitch of A above middle C. I've got that displaying here on the Mordax. Now if I want to drop down an octave, from A4 to A3, the frequency is going to drop in half to 220 hertz. And if we go up an octave to A5, it's 880 hertz. And up another to A6, and that's 1760 hertz. Everyone's internal experience is different, of course, but to me each of these steps seems fairly linear. It doesn't feel like the sound is doubled in some way. We experience pitch linearly, even though the physical reality of frequency isn't linear. If we take those values for the pitch of A at different octaves that we came up with, and bust them out to cover the 10 octaves that 10 volts will allow us to cover, then we get numbers like this. Starting at A0, way down at the lower limit of human hearing at 27.5 Hz, and way up past the range of hearing at 28,160 Hz at A10. Now if we look at all the semitones across those octaves, what's kind of astonishing here is that the very lowest semitone increase, from A0 to A0, sharp represents a frequency increase of just one and two-thirds hertz. The sound waves wiggle less than twice more a second and the pitch goes up a semitone. Now consider the very highest semitone change from G sharp 10 to A10. That requires an increase of 1580 hertz. That range, 1580 hertz, is enough for the whole lowest six octaves to fit in. But up here, it's just a single semitone. And this is called an exponential curve, the way it starts growing faster and faster and faster. At the scale of this graph, each pixel represents about 17 hertz. That means the entire lowest octave takes less than two pixels in height. The top octave, by comparison, takes the entire top half of the graph. And that's the sort of thing that happens when you keep doubling things. You need to have a lot more precision way down at the low end. A tiny change down there will have a noticeable effect on the pitch. But up at the top, you can hit that thing with a hammer and no one's going to notice. By comparison, when we can treat it linearly and we know that every semitone is going to be exactly 83 millivolts apart, there's a whole bit of complexity that disappears. Anyway, I dive in here not just because I'm a big old math geek, but because when we talk about frequency modulation, and in particular the difference between linear and exponential FM, it's going to come in handy to have an intuitive sense for how volt per octave relates to the frequency of pitches. There are actually a few synths that work directly with the frequency after a fashion. The Korg MS-20, for instance, uses a hertz per volt standard. Rather than using a linear increase of one volt to indicate the increase of one octave, this standard doubles the voltage to go up an octave, and then doubles it again to go up two octaves. That's a bit of a simplification, and it doesn't really warrant going into right now. It doesn't come up all that often. Now, just before I wrap up, I want to come back to show how one of the VCOs handles the incoming pitch CV. I'm going to use the old reliable CEM3340, because it's designed to basically just expose the functionality of the underlying chip, it can be really useful for illustrating this sort of thing. So let's take a look at the front panel. We've got the coarse and fine tuning knobs, and then down here there's two different inputs labeled CV. I know that when I first saw something like this, well, first I had gotten used to seeing things labeled pitch or volt per octave, but more than that, there's two of them. Which one should I use? Does it matter? Why would I need two of them? A lot of these questions can be answered just by looking at the schematic, which Nonlinear Circuits so kindly makes available. Well, and there's a lot here, so let's zoom in and get rid of the things not related to pitch. These three bits right here, these are the little trim pots on the back of the module, and they're mostly there to do a scaling and baselining the volt per octave response, so we can ignore them for this discussion. Maybe one day I'll do a video about the joy that is getting a DIY oscillator calibrated, but we can ignore them for now. Anyway, here's the coarse pitch control and the fine control. This construction here just means that the potentiometer is acting as a voltage generator. And the voltages are just being dumped, added together into the same circuit. The only real difference between these is that the fine tuning knob has a much larger resistor after it. That limits how much it's going to be able to add to the entire circuit to about plus or minus one volt. 
And that makes sense. That's literally what fine control is. And now here, we've got those two separate volt per octave inputs, the CV inputs from the front panel. Notice how, just like the two voltage generators for coarse and fine tuning, these values are added right into the total voltage that will eventually go to the oscillator. So the knobs control a fixed amount of voltage that serves as the baseline for when zero volts is input. And then both of the CV inputs are added to that baseline. And then all of that is fed into a bit of circuitry that converts the linear input into an exponential input, which can be used to uh, control the actual oscillator. Now, not every VCO works this way. There's a lot of different ways to do things, but this is fairly common, and there are some neat implications to it. For instance, what happens if we set the coarse tuning to output 3 volts, and, and we'll say that that works out to be a middle C, and then we're going to patch a negative voltage, say negative 1 volt, into the CV input. Well, it all just gets added together. 3 volts added to negative 1 volt equals 2 volts, and when it gets turned into pitch, and the result is going to be a C one octave below the middle. We patched in negative 1 volt, and it dropped by an octave, just as you'd think. That's not something that's necessarily advertised when you start working with modular VCOs. Many, although not all, oscillators will accept a negative voltage, and that'll drop the pitch below its setting on the panel. But you might not have noticed that I left something out when I isolated the part of the schematic that handles CV. This bit here. This is the part of the circuit that handles exponential FM input. It might be surprising to see that it's just adding voltage into the total, just like any of the other CV inputs. That input has a potentiometer before it, so you can scale the input. But if you were to turn it all the way up to 100%, this would function exactly the same as the other two CV inputs. And I have to say that really surprised me the first time I realized what I was looking at. But the more I thought about it, the more sense it made. This is frequency modulation, after all. Modulate just means to change, so changing the frequency. And changing the CV will definitely change the frequency. However, it's not directly changing the frequency, right? It's changing the CV, and that goes through a linear to exponential converter to turn it into the actual frequency. But with that little bit of a teaser, I'm going to leave the FM discussion at that. Hopefully that whets your appetite for the next video, where I'm going to dig in a lot deeper. And that's it, folks. We've covered a lot of ground here, and I hope you got to this point having learned at least a little bit. I certainly learned a lot while I was creating the video, and I think we're in a good position now for the next video where I'm finally going to really dig into FM. If you did make it this far, congratulations, you're awesome. And if you haven't subscribed yet, you should do that now so you'll see when the next video drops. Thanks for watching.